Hi, everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles together and solo and all things Beatles related as well. I'm Darren DeVivo, and I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City, a non-commercial public radio station broadcasting at 90.7 FM, uh, 90.7 FM HD2 as well. And plus, you could stream us on our website, WFUV.org, and download our app and listen there. Uh, I've been on the air at WFUV now for almost 38 years, uh, and uh, obviously I'm a huge Beatles fan, and joining me, as is the case on every Things We Said Today, are my good friends Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. Now, Ken, you know, is a longtime radio personality like yours truly. I think Ken's been doing it slightly longer than I have, and most of his 40-some-odd years in broadcasting have uh, included a lot of uh, Beatles-oriented programs. Ken's done a bunch of them, and that's made up uh, 90, 95% of his, of his career. Um, some, of, some of Ken's years behind the mic were spent at satellite at uh, XM Satellite Radio, and he currently hosts the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and he's part of the video cast. I'm sure a number of you have watched Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. So I want to say uh, howdy to Ken Michaels. Howdy, okay. Ken Michaels. A big howdy do to you, Darren <laughs> and <also>, DeVivo. <laughs> thank you. And also Alan Cozen, the acclaimed writer, journalist, and music critic, who has also spent roughly 40 years writing, met most of that time at the New York Times, writing about classical music and the Beatles, of course. And over the years, Alan has contributed to countless publications and can be seen today in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and, uh, and many more. Alan's written a bunch of books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Plus, there's a bunch of other books covering a variety of topics, including classical music and part one of a Paul McCartney book uh, that you've heard us talk about. So uh, a big howdy to, to Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? Great, Darren. How are you? All righty. And uh, before we get into today's topic, uh, you know what we usually do? We start things off with the latest in Beatles news and Beatles related news. So I throw it over to my buddy, Ken Michaels. Well, uh, as I'm sure you have expected, we haven't done a show now for three weeks. So um, a lot of news has accumulated and we're going to start with the sad news on the past thing, as you know, of Ronnie Spector on January the 12th. Of course, uh, one of the legendary singers of the rock era, known for being the lead vocalist in her group, the Ronettes, and produced by Phil Spector with hits like Be My Baby and Baby I Love You. The Ronettes actually were part of the Beatles 1966 U.S. tour, but minus Ronnie. Apparently, Phil didn't want her to go on the tour. She had a record contract with the Beatles company, Apple, and released the single of the George Harrison song, Try Some, Buy Some, in 1971. And as the B-side, the Harrison Phil Spector song, Tandoori Chicken. And the original intention, actually, was for Ronnie to record an entire album for Apple with the hopes for it to be her big comeback. There were other songs recorded. Uh, Ronnie released an album in 2014 called English Heart, in which she covered songs from British Invasion Acts of the 60s. And she recorded the Beatles song, I'll Follow the Sun, for that album. Um, and just going back to what I had mentioned, uh, the album for Apple, they did plan a full album. And in addition to those two songs, um, it is known that she recorded a few more, you being one of them, which George released also um, on his album Extra Texture. So uh, Ringo Starr posted online, God bless you, Ronnie. Peace and love to all the family. Peace and love. Any of you like to comment about Ronnie Spector? Um, not so much directly about Ronnie Spector, but... Um... I think it was in 2003, I interviewed David Bowie at WFUV and Bowie was promoting his album Reality 
and on reality was a cover of Try Some, Buy Some. Right. And we got into a good conversation about it because I thought it was such a, 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 a sort of an odd song, not only for David Bowie to cover, but really anybody. It's, you know, it's a deep track in Harrison's catalog. And I'm sure a lot of casual music fans don't even know that, you know, the Ronnie Spector recorded the song as well. The single, I guess you could say it's kind of obscure. Kind Very. Of, <laughs> you know, yeah. So uh, we got to talking about it. And David Bowie didn't know that George Harrison had recorded a version of it. Um, uh, I told him it was on Living in the Material World. And I was like, I, I, how did you... How did you find the song? Well, I knew he had said he'd heard Ronnie Spector, uh, which I found even more fascinating because I said to him, that's a pretty rare 45. I mean, I, I think it showed up on the charts in the U.S. for like maybe a week or two and change. And who knows what it did in the U.K., but it wasn't a hit per se. And um, he had just stumbled upon it in 70, 71, right. 72, 71, 71. Yeah, he stumbled upon it in 71 and he loved it. And he never heard George Harrison's uh, version of it. But we, you know, uh, the whole thing was that rather odd choice for him of a song for him to cover. Um, but uh, it's it's kind of like not directly related, but it's something that, of course, I'm never going to forget. Because that was that was kind of like the thing when the conversation, that was the uh, the thing that made, made you relax a little more because we got into the type of conversation where for a split second there, I was talking to a friend of mine, you know, sitting next to me in the car, you know, it got very casual from there. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, being a New Yorker, Ronnie Spector's royalty here and uh, her Christmas shows, um, I guess they used to, she used to do them. I think at the bottom line, I know folks, uh, friends of mine who have seen her at the old BB, BB King's Blues Club. Right. You know, swore by going at Christmas time to see Ronnie Spector's Christmas show. And of course, uh, one of the great records ever, A Christmas Gift for You, uh, which later was reissued on Apple as Phil Spector's Christmas album. Hmm. Um, and then was available for years after that under that title. That's, uh, you know, we'll always keep Ronnie close to all our hearts. So rest in peace, Ronnie Spector. I'm fortunate that I got to see Ronnie Spector back to perform it's it's either two or three times at mohegan sun and it would always be at the end of the year mm -hmm. i think she tailored her concerts around the christmas songs mixing that with her hits and i was just amazed at how her voice has how her voice was so strong still like it hadn't shown anywhere like it's the same singer from 1963 mm -hmm. doing be my baby and um something i <sighs> I didn't mention this on um, uh, uh, an interview that I just did on my YouTube channel because we were talking about Ronnie Spector. I wasn't aware of this until our friend John Montagna posted this on his Facebook page. But are you guys aware that on the Let It Be album, the original album, the inner groove, you will find the words Phil and Ronnie yeah. inscribed. Oh, yeah. And let it be. Yeah. And it's on both sides, too. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, those I of you who have an that, original copy. Yeah, I knew that, but had completely forgotten about it. So when he posted that, I saw that post. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, oh, I, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never looked that closely to the inner groove. And now well, who, it's like, reads, wow, it's a who reads the inner grooves? You know what I mean? Beatles Although fans. if you're a fan, <laughs> if you're a fan, if you're a fan of the Eagles, there are messages in all of their albums in the inner groove that kind of link together as like an ongoing sentence. If you have Eagles albums, I'm, I'm sure it's better if they're closer to being first pressings. There's phrases written in the inner inner groove. I don't know if it's on both sides or one side. Mm. Uh, you know, whoever was in charge of doing the cutting, I guess, had a sense of humor. Well, thank you, John Montagna, for pointing that out to us, something I never knew. And I also remember that when John recorded his rock and roll album, which Phil Spector, well, in the beginning, did the production for, he said, I just want to be Ronnie, if you remember, mm -hmm. meaning he just wanted to be the singer. 
not a guitar player, not playing any of any other instruments, just wanted to be the singer. So yeah, we will miss Ronnie Spector for sure. Um, also, uh, I can't imagine anyone not knowing this, but just in case, um, the Beatles performance on the Apple rooftop uh, will be shown in IMAX theaters across the country on the 53rd anniversary of the concert, January 30th. Now I've been told that tickets went on sale and it is reserved seating for this IMAX event. Um, after that, well, actually I should say there's, there's a Q and a with Peter Jackson. That's a part of this whole thing. I'm not sure how that's coordinated, but, um, after that, the Apple rooftop concert will be shown in select movie theaters, uh, for three days, February 11th through the 13th. And there is now a release date for get back on DVD and Blu-ray. And that's on February the 8th. Unfortunately, there's no mention of bonus material because but, is, um, <laughs> what's that <laughs> what's that i said because there isn't any yeah it's just, it's just I, I, three episodes as we saw them and uh you know well we heard it first on our own show peter jackson said that they weren't interested in in, in bonus material and and uh I guess that basically is, I think what he was telling us is that that, that basically is why it went from six hours to eight hours, because he felt that if they're not going to want the bonus material. I'm going to put the bonus material right in the, the original thing. Mm -hmm. But well, of course, you, now Peter, that that was that. the original thing, we want more bonus material, don't we? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think Peter, wasn't Peter sort of holding out hope that there might be like a last minute change that yeah. they could have extended maybe to 10 hours or something. If it came out, it was still a little bit of an if it came out on Blu-ray yeah. or DVD. Yeah, he, um, I think he said he was still going to continue arguing it with them. But I, I, my impression, like from the talk, is that I don't think he thought that the release on Blu-ray and DVD was that imminent. You know, I mean, this is really, it's sooner than I thought it would be. And um, yeah, yeah. You know what? Here's, think, here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> Disney is putting this out, but the rights to the film are owned by Apple. I have a feeling that Disney will have the Blu-ray and DVD for a while, and then it reverts to Apple. And then Apple can do what it wants. And if they want to put out something with extra material or, say, the, uh, an additional cut of the rooftop without the street scenes and police scenes, uh, possibly packaging the original Let It Be in the same set, which is one of the other things mm -hmm. Peter Jackson talked about, um, that, you know, that can happen then whenever that future thing is. So we can look forward to buying it again. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe when it comes out again, it will be in an expanded form of some kind. I, I'm sure if Peter Jackson has his way, it will be. So um, we'll just do have you to think it, it gets pulled off Disney plus after it's out on Blu-ray and DVD? Maybe not immediately. I, I don't know what the, you know, it depends what the terms of the contract are. Uh, it, it could be that it, it runs for a year or, or however long, whether the D, the Blu-ray is out, or not you know it's it's uh it, it, it's odd though that they that they are doing it so soon i i just hadn't been prepared for that it's fine with me yeah but... i was shocked yeah <laughs> i was shocked and i also i was always under the understanding that the original let it be would be reissued fairly close in time with the get back dvd blu-ray so I'm kind of hoping that sometime this year they would do that. And like you said, they could add bonus material to that too. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. They're actually we, planning right now the huge $2,000 box set that's going to come housed in uh, a box that is made from the wooden planks that were put on the roof itself uh, for the performance. And if you're lucky, you'll get one that's got Paul McCartney skid mark from his shoes uh, on it. That will be the rarest one, the rarest mm -hmm. version. But you're giving them great ideas. You know, I get a free copy if you use my idea. 
All right. Uh, the Beatles on website, thebeatles.com. They're selling the DVD. You can order it right now for $34.99 and $44.99 for the Blu-ray. As of today, we're doing this on January the 18th, this taping. Taping. This session. Uh, the DVD is selling on Amazon for $27.99. And the Blu-ray is not listed yet. Although I'm sure it will be. The it's newest not bad for eight hours, you know. Oh it's, no! Yeah. Very well worth it. Yeah, you get your money's worth. Mm -hmm. uh, the newest reissue of A Hard Day's Night, the movie, has just come out from Criterion. Mm -hmm. This is in four four uh, K UHD Blu Ray combo as two discs, also a DVD Blu Ray combo, which is three discs, and just a DVD for one disc. And it's got loads of special edition features that just came out. More exciting news is that there's already a website devoted to the upcoming archival release for John and Yoko and Elephant's Memories album sometime in New York City. No information has been offered yet other than it's being billed as the ultimate mixes for 2022. This year, of course, marks the album's 50th anniversary. Will it be coming out soon? You would think so, since the, the website was just developed. If they want to follow its release close to the actual anniversary, that would be in June. Also due out in February is the tribute album to Yoko Ono called Ocean Child, Songs of Yoko Ono, featuring various artists covering Yoko's material. The album is being curated by Death Cab for Cuties' Benjamin Gibbard and will feature the band Death Cab for Cutie along with David Byrne and Yola Tango covering Who Has Seen the Wind. Other artists include Deerhoof, The Flaming Lips, Sharon Von Etten, and others. The album is actually due out on Yoko's 89th birthday, which is February the 18th. So, very busy month for Beatle fans coming in February. And yes, Darren. WFUV is playing the David Byrne and Yola Tango song. Cool. What do you think of it? Which is... Who has seen the wind? Thank you. I was going to say, listen, the snow is falling. I always got those two mixed up. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we're on that one. So that's very cool. Hmm. Yeah, I always love all these cover albums. And current artists of today, you know, showing that Yoko was an influence and admiring her work. Um, I just finished recording an interview with Bruce Spizer, Al Sussman and Tom Franjoan from my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. All of us discussing the Get Back documentary, and Bruce revealed that he will have another new book coming out in the fall, covering the Beatles' Rubber Soul and Revolver albums and everything in between, including <laughs> the Yesterday and Today album. A popular feature of his books that uh, commemorate Beatles albums is that he takes memories from fans about these albums, and what was going on at the time, and he puts them in the book. If you would like to contribute something for Bruce's new book, you can contact him uh, at his website at beetle.net, and the deadline to send him something is February the 15th. His book coming out in the fall. Just recently being leaked out on the internet as a performance from the Beatles dated April 5th, 1963, at the EMI house. This was a private performance for record company executives uh, of the group doing two of their big hits at the time, From Me to You and Please Please Me. This was done to celebrate the award for their first silver disc for the single of Please Please Me. I've heard it, sounds just like the Beatles at that time. Very clean recording too. Yeah. Uh, Philip Norman is best known to Beatle fans for writing the Beatles biography Shout. And more recently, a bio for Paul McCartney. It does not rest there. John Bazzini tells us that he has a book coming out on George Harrison titled Dark Horse in Search of George Harrison, which won't be out until 2023. The Grammy Awards are being postponed due to COVID. Paul McCartney is nominated for two awards for Best Song with Find My Way and Best Rock Album for McCartney 3. And George Harrison's 50th anniversary edition for All Things Must Pass is also up for a Grammy Best Boxed or Special Limited Edition Package. A few more news items here. Edgar Winter 
has been busy for several years playing a tribute album to his late brother, guitarist Johnny Winter. A new album is due out in April to be called Brother Johnny, and it will include 17 tracks handpicked by Edgar and producer Roger Hogarth, including two new songs from Edgar. And this tribute will have a star-studded cast of musicians helping out, including Ringo Starr, Michael McDonald, Joe Walsh, Steve Lukather, Joe Bonamassa, Keb Moe, and others. And the Liverpool Echo is reporting that Jerry Marsden, the legendary singer who was lead singer of Jerry and the Pacemakers, who sadly passed away last January at the age of 78, will be honored by his hometown. The Mersey Ferry Terminal at Liverpool's Pierhead will be renamed the Liverpool Jerry Marsden Ferry Terminal. Jerry's classic hit Ferry Cross the Mersey is still played on the ferry every day. And Jerry was also given the Honorary Freedom of the Ferries Award in 1985 in honor of his special connection. So it's nice to see Jerry honored there. Of course, part of uh, the NEMS family, managed by Brian Epstein, produced by George Martin. Nice to see Jerry uh, honored that way. I rode on uh, Ferry Cross the Mersey. I don't know if it's the only ferry they have running. Uh, I don't know. But uh, 1994, my honeymoon, we ended up uh, in Liverpool towards the end of our two weeks in England. And I was on a ferry going across the Mersey. And of course, I sang the little pieces of the song that I knew to my wife, who immediately <laughs> thought, what the heck did I do marrying this putz for? <laughs> who's, singing, who's singing Jerry and the Pacemakers to me on a ferry in Liverpool. <clears throat> so... She, Did you manage to get an audience there for your singing? Or no, but a few backing people, away. She asked a, a few people asked it. It's a nice word. A few <laughs> people did come up to my wife and, and offered to throw me overboard, but um, you know, she didn't feel like explaining back home to what happened to me. So she said, No, leave him alone, he's all right. We'll give him his meds and he'll go to sleep soon. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the news. That's oh no news. That's, that's fit, fit to print. To print. Yep, yep, nice. All right. Thank you, Ken. Uh, that was very newsy. Uh, and now we move on to our topic for the show, uh, which is misconceptions about the Beatles. Uh, and and I, I guess also could some of those misconceptions could spill onto some of the individual work and whatnot. Um, we had a, a debate, the three of us did, in planning um, this show out uh, about things that we've heard over the years, rumors, um, fake news, uh, and other things that maybe actually some people think are real and have become fact over time. We're here to shoot them all down or debate back them all off, one or the other. Yeah. So do you want to start, Ken? Um, well, one of the ones that I would like to bring up um, is actually kind of a two-part thing. Um, every now and then I hear it being said that the Sgt. Pepper album was really a, a Paul McCartney album or a Paul McCartney, George Martin album. And I've also noticed over time that a lot of people are giving John, I think, a lot less credit where I think he deserves a bit more credit. Um, and to expand on that, and I'll discuss it, you know, a few minutes later, that the last half of the Beatles recorded career as a group that it was a McCartney dominated mm. period. Um, I can understand why people feel that way. Uh, discussing uh, Sergeant Pepper, when you look at things from the standpoint of songwriting, I think that Paul wrote more than John did. But if you break it down song by song, I think John's input as a songwriter was more than we give him credit for. We all know that he wrote Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. He wrote, well, most of being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. We don't know how much Paul wrote, but Paul did say he helped pick out the lyrics from the poster uh, with John. We know that John wrote Good Morning, Good Morning, and that John wrote a substantial portion, whether you think it's, you know, most of the song of A Day in the Life. But also along with that, with little help from my friends is a joint collaboration between the two. I don't know if we know if it was exactly 50, 50, but I do know that John had input in the songwriting of that song. 
And also in the case of, say, getting better, you may have heard about this before, but John did come up with the line, <laughs> couldn't get much worse. Paul has uh, rarely mentioned that, but, you know, um, in addition to that, uh, John did say, it might have been in Playboy, that the line, I used to be cruel to my woman, I beat her and kept her apart from the things that she loved, that that came from him. Also, where she's leaving home is concerned, the counter mel melody mm -hmm. that we gave her most of our lives came from John. That's a very important part of that song. It makes a huge difference in that composition. Um, so once you add all that, um, I believe, yeah, Paul still wrote more than John, but not overwhelmingly. You know, it's a little bit more balanced, I think, when it comes to the songwriting. Give Paul the credit for the concept of the album that, you know, this was a band, you know, in the guise of another band. We could be someone else, you know. Um, I think Paul deserves a ton of credit for uh, Sgt. Pepper. But I do think that sometimes, you know, not enough credit is given to John's contribution when it comes to the writing on that album. Would the two of you like to uh, add your opinions on this? Um, you want to you want to go first, Alan? Sure. Um, I could um, argue the other position in a way. I mean, uh, what wh what you say is true. I mean, it, and 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 when you put it that way, it um, it really does uh, show John to be notably more involved than people often think. But the fact that the concept of the album was Paul's, I mean, that's, that's I think, one of the things that make people feel that Pepper is more of a Paul album. Um, and John, in his interviews, sort of has talked about Pepper as more of a Paul album. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, I... I think to sort of pull back from Pepper itself um, and, and look more broadly at the Beatles, 1966, 67, um, you know, you're seeing John, um, as, as, as Cynthia has said, get more involved with acid and that as he got involved with acid, that, uh, that sort of changed his personality and, the impression that you get just looking more broadly is that one of the things it did is it made him a little lazier about Beatles stuff. I mean, the fact that he wrote all of the things that you mentioned um, may sort of indicate that he wanted to retain control of the Beatles on some level, but just wasn't that interested in getting it together with the songwriting. Um, that said, the Pepper Sessions did begin with Strawberry Fields Forever, which is, you know, one of his greatest things, you know, one of the mm. Beatles' greatest things, um, one of the greatest things of human sieve. <laughs> Not, you know, go too far. Um, but, uh, you know, and so he, they did start off the sessions with one of his. He did come in with something that, you know, but he had just been in Spain making a film. Um, it doesn't seem like being an actor was something he really wanted to be, but the fact that he was willing to try it sort of indicates that 66 is she was sort of looking around for other things to do mm -hmm. um, while Paul was coming up with things like the concept for, you know, let's, let's be another band, you know, and the other Beatles seem to have bought into that, um, you know, and they made the album and the album really was something special. Um, and John's contributions, John's contributions to it are really kind of interesting. There is a day in the life, which is brilliant. And there's Lucy, which is brilliant. But good morning, good morning. He basically did from a cornflakes commercial. Um, and as we know, the, the benefit for Mr. Kite was from a circus poster. The interesting thing about that for me is that, okay, 
he he's kind of you know being a little lazy about songwriting and coming up with and just pulling these ideas out of the air but what he does with them is so astonishing i mean being for the benefit of mr kite it doesn't matter that the words are mostly from a circus poster that's an incredible piece of music you know um and you know and good morning good morning as well you know, I mean, there's, you know, he's got the, the cornflakes thing. Good morning. Good morning. And that's that was the, the impetus of it. But, you know, nothing to do to save his life. Call his wife in. I mean, that that's not nothing. You know, it, 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 it's he 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 filled that out. You know, it may start as a mundane idea, but he made it into really a, a, a pretty cool song. I mean, I'm not going to put it on the level of a day in the life necessarily or or mm-hmm. strawberry fields, but it's. It's, you know, it's uh, it's good. I like it, you know, and, uh, you know, Paul's contributions too. I mean, Paul's contributions on that album, you know, include reaching back to his childhood for something like when I'm 64. Um, and, you know, and that might have been because of Strawberry Fields, really, you know, and we lose that link because Strawberry Fields was taken away and put out as a single, but, you know, Strawberry Fields was talking about, you know, John's memories of childhood in, in some way or, or, you know, the the reference to Strawberry Fields itself. Um, uh, and when I'm 64, it might have just put Paul in mind of, you know, that little thing he wrote in Liverpool when he was like 14, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as something that could be sort of revived for this if it if it was going to be a a sort of liverpool themed album at first which it didn't turn out to be and i'm not totally convinced that it was ever meant to be um i have heard Mm. people like bill harry claim it was but bill harry i don't know was like you know there in those sessions you know hearing about about that and you know why he why he says that um, but those two songs, Strawberry Fields and When I'm 64, kind of provide the start of a link to, you know, what could have been a Liverpool theme thing. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I do think that Paul was beginning to take the reins a bit, but um, I, I see it more as because he recognized that they needed something else. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, and that John was at that point happy to just sort of hang around at home making weird little tapes for himself. And, you know, what were the Beatles going to be doing? They weren't going to be touring. You know, they were kind of at a weird place in at the end of 1966. And someone had to take the reins and Paul did it. So. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned um, John being, um, you know, involved with how I won the war as an actor. It was then when he admitted he was thinking for the first time, what would I do if I didn't have the band? Mm -hmm. And actually, when you're talking about Strawberry Fields Forever, I always thought that that, if anything, inspired Penny Lane. Maybe more so than when I'm 64 writing the lyrics for that, because it's all about, you know, memories of growing up in Liverpool. And certain Mm -hmm. sites in Liverpool that you remember. Um, So you got three songs that tie together. Yeah. But my point is with with Sgt. Pepper, I think that, you know, John should be given a bit more credit songwriting wise. When it came to driving the band, yeah, you notice that the second half of their time as a band, Paul was the one that was always trying to come up with ideas and driving the band for new projects and all. Um, Darren? Hi. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, my, my opinions are exactly the same as both of you, but I want to lean a little bit more, a little off Sergeant Pepper, more towards the general, general perception that, that Paul was the heavy or had become the heavy f- during the later years. And it kind of, my opinion sort of, you know, echoes what, what Alan just said. I just think McCartney was more focused as a Beatle, focused being a Beatle, I mean, uh, that was it for him. So he was writing at his best at that point. I think also think that the uh, tail end of the 60s, McCart- was Mc- one of McCartney's peaks and maybe the peak when it came, came to creativity, songwriting and whatnot. Um, 
uh, I mean, you could maybe come up with another era or two. That's not the point. But while Paul was was peaking at that time, I think John's attention was taken away. It wasn't 100 percent on the Beatles. Right. He had met Yoko. He found that there was more to life than just being a Beatle. There were other outlets. If he's thinking when he was making How I Won the War, what am I going to do if I didn't have the band? Well, now he's finding out. He can make films with Yoko. He can tap into that artist um, side of him that he had going back to when he was a boy in Liverpool, writing poetry and drawing pictures. Um, and it didn't have to be conventional art. It could be anything. He didn't have to make his own... Uh, he didn't have to write his own songs or make his own albums. He could twiddle with the knobs on a tape deck and come up with an album. And that was fun. And, you know, I've, I've messed around with tapes and stuff. It can be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know anybody that wants to listen to it after I've made loops of uh, belches and stuff like that. But, but no, these were other things that, 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 that I think that John found value in. And, and that took him away from, you know, if he was going to write, uh, had a quota of 10 songs, maybe he was only going to come to a session with six or seven as a result of that. Meanwhile, you're in a band with Paul McCartney, who's got it all invested into the group uh, at that point. Uh, and I, I think it can be as simple as that. Yeah, Paul probably was a heavy. I don't think he was uh, the be all end all of Sergeant Pepper, all for the exact same reasons that all of you pointed out. And even George, whose input was minimal on Sergeant Pepper, what he did input was massive. Um, you know, the just the Indian influence to to the vibe of the album mm. alone is enormous. Um, so uh, I, I think it is it isn't a misconception that. Paul sort of dominated Pepper or Pepper was a bit more of a Paul album. And those later years were McCartney um, driven, you know, lack of a better way of putting it. But I do think that Paul was, was, was the heavy because he was peaking at that point. And again, I think John's attention was, was elsewhere. And I think we sort of saw that in the movie. In the Get Back movie, how John could come in and out of focus uh, when it came to the to the Beatles. Mm. I think that's another thing that we go ahead. Some excellent points there, Darren, and and we can debate. You know, when was Paul's creative peak? We should do a separate show yeah, just on that. I think that <laughs> that was. I mean, he was really. I mean, you look at it. I mean, I, I don't know what the, the we don't know. We'll never know exactly what the dynamic was between John and Paul as writers, you know, when when they were, were writing songs, sitting down, talking about, listen, I have this. I have this song or, you know. Um, you know, Paul's pumping out things like The Long and Winding Road and Blackbird and writing Goodbye for Mary Hopkin and uh, Come and Get It. And then there's. Uh, uh, let it be and there's all these incredible songs uh, maybe John thought at right right now I can't keep up with this guy you know uh, so here's what I got right now knock yourself out um, I'm going to go make a film about a fly uh, you know it, I'm <laughs> making a joke but at the same time you know John had other places he could go channel his energies and that really exploded in 68. That would have been after Sergeant Pepper. But, um, you know, by the end of 1968, opportunities were popping up for John. Right. Um, you know, that weren't there, that Paul didn't need, didn't need them. He had his, he was a Beatle. That's all Paul needed at that point. Same could be said for George. You know, hmm. I think we talked a lot about this, you know, on in previous shows, especially talking Get Back. George also found his outlet and realized I don't have to put up with maybe getting them to pay attention to one or two of my songs, you know, or my song doesn't have to take the back seat to wild honey pie. You know what I mean? That, that, that doesn't have to be like that anymore. Right. I'm only where John and Paul are concerned. I'm only talking in terms of the actual songwriting and what they released. 
I mean, if you break it down, as some people might, like the Red and the Blue album, 1962 to 66 and 67 to 70, I don't think that Paul dominated the group from 67 to 70 the way that John dominated the songwriting from 62, well, certainly through 65. Once you're getting into Revolver, it's very balanced between the two of them. But I think that people have a misconception about the second half of the Beatles, that it was more dominated by Paul. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that many of the A-sides of the singles tilted towards Paul. Although you still had Come Together and the Ballad of John and Yoko and All You Need Is Love for John songs and all that. But if you were to go song per song on every single album, you would find that it's a little bit more balanced between John and Paul songs. I actually went, because I always said to myself, you know, the White Album is so Lennon dominated. And it's not. <laughs> There's a difference of two songs between John and Paul. It's, it's much more balanced between the two of them. But I do think overall, yeah, McCartney had more input in the songwriting the second half, but it wasn't as the way that John was in the early years from 60 to 62 to 65. I'm only talking songwriting here. Yeah. I kind of think when people say that Paul dominated in the second half or the second, the end of their career from Pepper on that, that they don't mean just the songwriting, that they mean that he became sort of the, the de facto leader of the group because Mm. John had, in some ways tuned out, but um, whether or not John tuned out, I mean, it's an, another interesting thing that like another one little piece of the puzzle that comes from the, the get back film is that discussion just before the rooftop when Paul is saying, well, but if we just go play the thing on the roof and that's the end of the film and it, it's just the, we now have a film about us making an album you know, big deal. And John says, well, making an album is what we do, you know? Um, <laughs> but, but if you, you take that bit of conversation and you put it together with Paul wanting to, you know, coming up with the idea of like, let's pretend that we're a different band and that way we can sort of break out of the whole Beatles thing. And then right after that, what let's go, get, you know, some cameras and a bus and go touring around England with no script and Mm -hmm. just, you know, film it. That'll be different for us. And it definitely was different for them. Um, And then uh, White Album, I can't see any particular Paul leadership there. But then immediately after the White Album, the idea of, okay, let's do some concerts to promote this, which morphed into uh, Get Back slash Let It Be. Um, So Paul was taking the initiative and wanting to do something different than just going in and making an album. If they're, you know, if we're not going to tour, is is that just going to be it? We convene for an album every few months or once a year and, and that's it. No, I want to do something more interesting. I want to go film around the country or I want to write an album of new songs and play it and record it live, you know? Um, And I think he, you know, he definitely was, I, I don't think it can be argued that he was coming up with those ideas, you know, that he was coming up with ways of breaking out of the, you know, we're a pop group, we go in and make albums mold. You know, so in that mm. sense, I think it's it's fair to say that, it, you know, he sort of took over the leadership, even if the songwriting was, you know, not dominated by him necessarily. That's that's the way I always took it when people say that, you know, about Paul dominating the uh, last bit. OK, well, those are excellent points. I knew this would be debatable. <laughs> One thing you can't debate is that. um Pretty much everything the Wings did was dominated by Paul. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so uh, now that was uh, that. Ken is thinking, I did have the idea to have him on the show. <laughs> uh, all right, so that was a Ken thing. Alan, do you have a, a, a misconception that pops into your head that um, we want to discuss? 
You know what um, you still run into a lot? And in fact, in, in one of the comments on one of our shows, someone actually brought this up and said, you know, and, and, and I don't think it had anything to do with us because we haven't discussed it, but it, it was me. So maybe it was just a comment on Facebook, but it was something like, uh, you know, why do people still tell the story of, you know, George Martin discovering the Beatles and, you know, everyone else turning Brian Epstein down and then George Martin hearing something he liked in the music and deciding to give them a chance when it didn't happen that way. Um, and And I think that remains the standard telling, but as we know from Tune In, uh, the first part of Mark Lewison's trilogy, uh, it didn't happen that way at all. I mean, it, George Martin had already turned them down. Um, and, you know, the, what's often said is that George Martin was on vacation when all the other EMI producers turned them down, but then he came back and listened and heard something. But he had turned them down like everybody else. And um, the... Uh, the story that, that Jim Foy, the uh, disc cutting guy at the HMV shop, sent him on to George Martin sort of changes a, a detail, which is that he actually sent him on to Sid Coleman at Ardmore and Beechwood. And Ardmore and Beechwood was EMI's publishing arm. Um, and Sid Coleman and uh, Kim Bennett, who was a song plugger for Ardmore and Beachwood, really liked uh, Like Dreamers Do and maybe some of the other originals that were in the DECA tapes, which is what Brian brought around to them to play. And Brian basically said, well, you know, if you can, uh, you get them a recording contract, which was his main interest, where, well, their main interest was publishing songs. Um, you can have the publishing. Um, and Kim Bennett, uh, apparently, you know, and, and here's a guy whose name until tune in, nobody knew, you know, he basically took the bull by the horns, so to speak, and uh, basically went to EMI, uh, was told again by all the producers, no, we heard them, we don't want them, and went up to um Ooh, it wasn't Joe Lockwood. Uh, went higher up the chain. Uh, Le- um, Len Wood. Uh, Len Wood. Len Wood. Yes. Uh, and persuaded Len Wood uh, to have EMI record a single of some of these originals by this group. Um, because after all, Ardmore and Beachwood is their publishing arm. Why don't they work together on this? And uh, basically what happened was that uh, George Martin had two things that were irritating Len Wood. One was that in his recent contract negotiations, he was pushing for a producer royalty, which was pretty much unheard of. And it was especially unheard of when he was pushing it, which was, you know, you can understand George Martin pushing for a producer's royalty in 1963 or 1965, but this was before the Beatles were there. He still wants a a production royalty. Um, And EMI found that really irritating. And the fact they found out that um, he was having sort of a romance with his secretary, Judy Lockhart. Um, who he eventually married. Um, but the idea... He, he was married at the time, too. He was married at the time, but I think they were splintering. Um, the fact that this was going on um, offended Len Wood. The fact that he wanted a producer's royalty offended Len Wood. And so as punishment (laughs) this is like the great aspect of this story as punishment he was given the beatles to record um and you get a sense of i mean this is one once mark lewis and ran into kim bennett and i'm not exactly sure how that happens but um he also got verification from other people that oh yeah that's that's actually how it happened. I think Norman Smith um, was one of the people who uh, confirmed that for him. 
Um, and he also told me that, uh, you know, he really sort of put uh, Kim Bennett's feet to the fire, wow. you know, for details and, you know, looking for any kind of contradictions or anything wrong with the story. And um, but basically ended up getting it verified. Uh, and, and this was something, this is one of the things in tune in that nobody knew anything about. And a lot of the world seems not to have caught up with yet, even though it's been out for nearly a decade. And by the way, Mark, where's volume two? Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, it, but, but it puts, puts another piece of the story. It clarifies another piece of the story, which is that we had heard like long ago. And I think it's even mentioned in the Re Mark Lewison's recording sessions book that um, George Martin didn't initially come to the Beatles artist test recording session. Um, he left it in the hands of his assistant, Ron Richards. And it was only after they'd been playing for a while that Ron Richards sent a note down to the canteen where George Martin was just hanging out. So obviously not like doing anything really, really important that made it impossible for him to go to the session, sent him a note saying, you know, there's, you really want to come and hear this. And then he came and heard it. And, you know, the rest is more or less history. We'll hear how the history changes as further uh, research goes on. But, um, but, you know, in a way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the story as everybody has wanted it to be um, isn't what actually happened. And, and, and this is what happened instead. I mean, do any of us feel uh, any less about George Martin because of that? I don't think so. No, yeah. but you know, the thing that I fa found ast ast astounding about this whole thing is that the Beatles never attempted to record like dreamers do. Yeah. At EMI. If that was the song that Ardmore and Beachwood were so interested in, then why didn't they do it? Yeah, I don't know. And I and also did, thought... And, and why did George Martin try to get them to do How Do You Do It if the point was for them to be doing their own stuff so that Ardmore and Beachwood could publish it? Yeah, strange. Yeah, I thought that when Mark's book came out that this would be front page news <laughs> on newspapers. I mean, the way that we've been brought it to believe how the Beatles got their record contract is nothing to what the truth really was. And I think that the Beatles themselves never knew it. Mm -hmm. They didn't know this whole backstory. They probably didn't. Um, Brian, of course, would have. Brian Epstein. Um, and, you know, and there, then another interesting thing comes out of this. George Martin seems to have felt that being punished by Len Wood isn't something he necessarily wants to put up with. So because Ardmore and Beechwood was involved in this whole setup, he steered Brian Epstein towards Dick James for publishing. And Dick James ended up, um, you know, realizing that he, this was a competitive business and he needed to come up with something. He came up with the idea of Northern songs, um, which John and Paul would own a portion of and, uh, you know, and made it a, a very tempting thing. And so poor Kim Bennett and Sid Coleman and Ardmore and Beachwood are basically written out of history. You know, they got the publishing for Love Me Do you know, and I guess, P.S., I love you. And that was it, you know, um, and then they're just out of the picture. And they had worked really hard, got Brian Epstein what he wanted, which was a label deal for the Beatles, and then are just out of it. That's stupid. Mm. And they then formed a band with Pete Best. <laughs> <laughs> what and it also you. means uh, is that you're always told that they auditioned for EMI on June the 6th when in fact they already had a record deal anyway. Right. It was really their first session for EMI. It wasn't yeah. an audition. Well, they say it was an artist test, but, it, but it was, as you say, I mean, they had signed the contract a couple of days before we, we have a copy of the contract. Hmm. Um, that contract was signed before they, they turned up and um, you know, it basically, 
this is another, this is one thing that 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 Mark had been through with George Martin, you know, saying, well, how could you gave them a contract before you even heard them? No, 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 I, I, I couldn't possibly have done that. Well, in that case, when did you hear them before June 6? Well, I, I think I went up to Liverpool and heard them at the Cavern. Well, OK, let's look at their calendar and your calendar and figure out when that could have been. And there was no time it could have been, you know. Um, so, you know, George Martin didn't like the idea that once the contract became available, it showed that he had signed them before. Um, they came for that artist test or audition or for a session or whatever it was. Um, but he did. Now, if you look at the contract, it basically obligates EMI to virtually nothing, you know? So it's not as if he was giving away the store at Lenwood's command. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it basically said that in the, the course of a year, they were to record six sides or six songs, uh, which EMI could put out or not. And if they did, they get some fraction of a penny royalty. You know, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't giving away the store at all. Um, but, yeah, there are so many of these details that, you know, it's it's one thing if you you have a pop band that you when you sign it, you think it might be big for a couple of years and no one's going to be interested in all the details of how they were signed. So here's the official story of how they were signed. And then that became the official story. And now we know it wasn't quite like that. So, and I think, you know, we're going to find that we're going to find that with a lot of stuff in the Beatles as more and more research is done um, seriously, you know, as people begin to approach this as a serious historical thing, um, we're going to hear that a lot of the stories that we thought we knew weren't quite right. And that's one of them. And it's right at the beginning. And it's a, it's a big one, I think. What's funny about that whole thing is something that we didn't talk about, not really part of this conversation, is how on earth were the Beatles rejected so many times? You know what I mean? What, what were, you know, I mean, we don't, I guess we, we can't really put an exact number on how many rejections there were, but it sounds like there were a lot. And within EMI, there was more than one. There were like um, five at EMI alone. <laughs> you know, like what were the Beatles doing that wasn't appealing to the so-called experts? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, you know, what were they listening for? What were they looking for? That's not this topic. That's not this show, but something that occurred to me because I'd forgotten it wasn't just one rejection. It was there was multiple uh, layers that they went through at EMI. Mm -hmm. um, well, basically, we know so, what they were listening to. They were listening to pressings of the of acetate pressings of the deck audition. OK, so maybe they felt that the novelty things like the searchers tunes were too corny or maybe they, okay. you know, who knows? Um, it's it's you know, it wasn't the deck audition is I, I think, you know, we all enjoy listening to it, but it wasn't really the Beatles best inning. Right, right. Hmm. Okay. Good thing. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting part of their history because Brian Epstein wanted to show the variety within the band, mm -hmm. that they can do ballads and they can do rockers and they could do novelty records and also show that there's three lead singers here, mm -hmm. you know, to make them very different. And, hey, here's three original songs, too. Right. You know, that was part of the plan. And from what I understand, Pete Best in particular thought that, you know, the way he approached it was all wrong, that they were a rock and roll band and they should have just done rockers and showcased that. Mm -hmm. But part of the, the Beatles appeal, as it turned out, was because of the variety of music that right. they displayed in their catalog. Yeah. Eventually. So, you know, that they could they, they could they could put something like Till There Was You, mm -hmm. you know, right in there with their earliest songs so what else um, yeah well I, th I think we have time for maybe one more uh of these uh misconceptions and i could think of a few of them um the most obvious one which i don't know if you guys want to talk about this 
uh, we can, but it's been beat to beat to death. I think we even really got into it recently. Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles. It still flies around today You're and got a, a little life recently uh, in the publicity that got kicked up for the Get Back film. I mean, you, if you guys want to go through that uh, again, or we could uh, maybe hit on something else, I'll leave it up to the two of you, but that might be the number one misconception if you asked the man on the street uh, to come up with the, something about the Beatles that, you know, do you think this is true or uh, do you think this is, uh, you know, fake news? Mm -hmm. Alan, you want to take that up first or? Uh, yeah, matter? sure. Um, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I don't even know what to say about that anymore because it, it, it's, it's really kind of ridiculous, you know, except if you take the view that, um, you know, as we have already discussed on this show, that John wanted to work with Yoko. Um, whether that would have meant that uh, John would work with Yoko, but never work with the Beatles, uh, you know, who knows, you know, uh, as we saw in the to get back film George talking about making an album of his own stuff. John was already doing that. He was putting a already put out two virgins and of course the brilliant life with the lions. Um, uh, life piece in Toronto was not out yet, but was coming out soon. He was doing singles. He, you know, he, he actually had it set up exactly the way George described in the Let It Be film or Get Back film. Um, you know, I can do some of my stuff and then we can still do the Beatles. John could have done that, but, um, you know, he was interested in doing other stuff. He was interested in leaving the pop group thing behind. Um, and I'm saying pop group thing from like his point of view at that time, based on what he was saying. But we know that by then they were far more than a pop group. Um, still, you know, this is his emotional thing. This is the way he's looking at it. Um, he just wanted to make a break. Whether he would have come back, who knows? You know, it's, it's conceivable. Um, but by then things had taken another turn to do with Alan Klein and um, Paul's seriously not wanting to be represented by Alan Klein and his preference for the Eastmans. Um, didn't see a lot of Paul pushing the Eastmans on the Beatles, um, but, you know, he had brought them in and they were originally signed on to basically represent them legally. Um, and it could have be, become more than that. And possibly they would have all done better if it was, you know, but it's a tricky thing. You know, you, you don't necessarily want the in-laws of one of your partners to run your business. We were talking about this before the show. Um, but, uh, but look at what, uh, what the Eastman's basically did for Paul and, you know, and if, if the Beatles, all of them were, his, were their clients too, you would think that um, they all would have benefited, whereas they had to sue Klein to get out of, you know, to, uh, well, actually they didn't renew the contract with Klein and then he sued them and they had to sue to get out of that. It became a big mess that probably wouldn't have happened if they had gone Paul's way. But that has more to do with what broke the Beatles up than Yoko did, you know? Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't think Yoko... I don't think Yoko was there saying, yeah, John, you should quit this group and come with me and do our avant-garde stuff. I think that, you know, she was doing that stuff. John wanted to do that stuff too. And, uh, and, you know, it's up to him, you know, he wanted to do it. It's much truer to say that John broke up the Beatles, which, you know, he did. Hmm. Well put, yeah. well put. I would pretty much agree with just about everything Alan just said there, but I think kind of like what John said, John and Yoko was one name. <laughs> you couldn't just blame Yoko. John wanted to be with Yoko. He was in love with her. He was obsessed with her, that kind of a love. Mm -hmm. And I think that John was the type of artist who got bored very easily. Mm -hmm. He didn't like formats. 
he, you know, even though the Beatles, by nature, the fact that they were the biggest band in the world, they were given plenty of artistic freedom to do whatever they wanted to do. And even with that, John probably wanted more. And with Yoko, he saw the possibilities were endless. You can make anything you want to. You could put in an album of just silence if you wanted to. And that would be art. And that could be your next album. And I think this really fascinated him. And I think um, even though John even admitted he didn't understand all of Yoko's art, he definitely thought that she was brilliant and he wanted to do more and more with her. And I think, you know, I personally think the biggest reason why the Beatles broke up was because John wanted to do more with Yoko, you know, and there's no doubt that the Klein versus Eastman thing played a very big part, probably was the nail in the coffin. Because honestly, you know, I think nothing ever hurt Paul more than the other three going against them there. You know, he's always said that everything in the Beatles had to be done unanimously. And the other three signed a contract against his will. You know, so, um, yeah, you really can't blame Yoko for any of this. It's because John loved her. John wanted to be with her. John wanted to do almost everything with her whether or not they could have continued doing solo and the band at the same time which they did start to do anyway but to continue doing that for john to have pop records on his own and at the same time carry the band at the same time it's very difficult to do that you know so I think it's ridiculous to blame Yoko at this point. There's no doubt about it that it was different for Yoko to always, always be there in the studio. Um, and, and Paul was even acknowledging during the, the Get Back Let It Be sessions that, you know, he had to come to terms with the fact that he's in love with her and he was fine with that, but he still wanted the band to continue. Right. He still wanted to work with John. Um, so I, I think it's really it's crazy to ever say that that Yoko was the reason why the Beatles broke up. It's interesting. Like, one, one thing you said, you know, a few minutes ago about how John hated formats and he, you know, lost interest easily and all that. It, it it's, brings up another one of these Beatles mysteries. If that was the case, and, and I think you're right, I think it was the case. Why was it Paul who was saying, you know, we should pretend we're another band, we should go around making weird films, and we should do a deal with, you know, recording a new album of new songs live in a concert. And and John is saying, yeah, but, you know, making albums is what we do. John is the one in that discussion holding out for the normal format, the same old thing. Paul is the one who is saying, let's do something completely different, but what we but as the Beatles and what we do, you know? Maybe what John was thinking was, it's what we do with our albums that make all the difference. Mm. You can make changes in the music that you do, you know? I mean, revolution number nine. (laughs) How radically different was that for an album at the time? And Mm. I'll bet John wanted to do more of that stuff. Yeah. Darren? You know? I feel that in this discussion, it's pretty obvious that the key player here is Alan Klein. And one of the eye-opening moments of Get Back is the... I don't want to put it the wrong way, but almost the, 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 the way John was starstruck by Alan Klein from having met him, I guess, the one time. And and it, it almost seemed as though John was like kind of in awe and even gullible that he was in one meeting with Alan Klein was sold hmm. that Klein is otherworldly and he'll do such incredible things for us. There are those, I think, two instances where he's talking almost like Klein is uh, a divine thing of what he's capable of doing and john was under his spell i mean i don't know if you guys agree with me but john really was taken by what klein had to say and seemed like he wanted others you have to come here this 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 prophet i met 
because he had, you know, he said these things. He could, you know, we'd make two albums from now. We'll own the company. And, you know, all these things. Um, and you see that. And correct me if I'm wrong. There's a scene towards the end where John leaves the session. The session's pausing for the day. John's grabbing his coat because there's a meeting with Alan Klein. And in the, I guess, in the upstairs. Mm -hmm. And John's making a beeline for the door. We got to go. I got to go talk to him. Got to meet Alan mm -hmm. Klein. McCartney's nowhere to be found. Hmm. Almost as if Paul kind of knew even before that. I don't even know if McCartney knew that Klein had spoke to John and John was enamored over this guy. Yeah, because, um, because Paul wasn't there the, when John was telling George about the meeting. But right. John is also saying, you know, I don't want to say it all now because I want to tell you all together. Um, yeah. But, but you uh, could see John's oh, yeah. way he's talking to George. It's like this guy I saw, you know, he came in the room and the heavens opened. He knows more about me than you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, when I was watching that, it made me a little uncomfortable because I'm like... Um, John, don't you know how this is going to play out? Wait a minute. I'm 50 years in the future. He, he, mm -hmm. he, can't, he can't hear me. You know, even Glenn Johns was kind of, right. you know, like, okay, John, but, but, but I know this guy. He's, you know, he's with the Stones. Watch him. Uh, and the way John went into the, 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 the possibilities of being in a relationship with uh, Alan Klein told me, listen, this is the thing. This is the thing that ended the Beatles. Um, and uh, to, uh, to what extent George and Ringo were enthusiastic about Klein, we don't really know, but they were enough. They were enthused enough that they signed on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's, you know, but it's not sexy to say that. It's sexy to say the wife, a one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Broke it up. Yeah. Could have been Linda. Could have been Linda. Could have been Linda. Six, she meets Paul six months earlier and is a more of a vocal personality, more of someone in the spotlight. If Jane Asher, who was a who was a bit of a known uh, celebrity, I guess, at that time, uh, well, you know, maybe they got married. You know, you'd have people today talking to Jane Asher broke the Beatles up because he st she stole Paul's heart and they got married and. Now that he was a married man, he wasn't interested in hanging out with the boys anymore. So uh, Yoko was an easy target. And, I, you know, and Yoko's unfairly, and this angers me, a target in general for things like, you know, COVID. <laughs> you know, it, it, it gets ridiculous, you know, the, 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 the uh, hatred and the accusations that get thrown her away. It was easy to say that, oh, Yoko did it. Yoko was too responsible. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the fact of the matter is there were a lot of reasons why the Beatles broke up. Yeah. And we could all debate which the number one reason is. And there's no doubt Alan Klein was a huge factor, but I still think that John wanted a new life with Yoko. Yeah. Oh, I, I think agree. that's I think that's even don't more important. Think, don't you think that had Alan Klein not come around, it's very possible, and I think you kind of alluded to this, they could have kept going and there was nothing stopping the four of them from, you know, doing what Phil Collins ultimately did decades later. You know, George could have very easily cut his solo album, um, his, his, his All Things Must Pass, and John could have kept going on making singles and tape loop albums. But if you, if you were to take a look and I just discussed this in my, my video on my, my YouTube channel, at all these bands, and there's only a handful of them where you could say individual members had successful solo careers, none of them nearly as close as what the solo Beatles had, but they were kind of short-lived. You know, it was hard to maintain. In the case of Phil Collins, he had a solo career and the career with Genesis, and I think the fact of the matter is that because both of them were happening close you know, at the same time, it created so much saturation of Phil Collins on the radio that it ended up killing both careers because <laughs> yeah. Genesis records st started slipping in sales 
And gradually there was less interest in Phil Collins. It was too much. Mm. And when you're writing songs, how do you know what belongs on a solo album versus a, versus a group album? How do you know where to place it? If you're doing a tour, what songs do you do? How much solo music do you do? You know, the Eagles, individual members like Glenn Fry and Don Henley had successful solo careers. Joe Walsh, although Joe Walsh was a name before he joined the Eagles, yeah. you know, but it was some success, not a lot. And actually, the Eagles for a long time didn't even release an album as a group while the solo careers went on. Uh, Fleetwood Mac, the same thing. It's very difficult to maintain that. It sounds good in theory, you know, but I think that had the Beatles tried to continue and still put out solo albums in the same year, you know, it, all these complications come up. Yeah. Where do you place these songs? Mm -hmm. Where does it belong? Right. You know, if it, does a George Harrison song that he writes that's really more spiritual, that belongs on a solo album, but something that's more poppy and, you know, something more like For You Blue, that belongs on a Beatles record, you know? How do you decide where each one belongs? I feel you know, sure they could have worked it out. <laughs> it would be, and, and I, think I don't George, think so. In George's case, yeah. it would have been easy. He just could have gauged the reaction he was getting. In the studio with the others and go, okay, solo album. That's a solo song. But um, I don't know. It probably was easier for George because he would have been resigned to accept the fact that he was going to get less than John and Paul. Right. So just give a few songs for a Beatles album. Well, no way. We, we have this agreement where George was going to be getting as much as John and Paul. And but that never happened. It never happened, but that's how it could have, you know, proceeded. And and the other mm -hmm. part of that discussion that you know when they're talking about the idea of a of putting out a Christmas single that year is you know everyone bring in their their best idea and we'll decide we'll pick one. So it could have been like that too. And any they could have come to a session, played some things, and like Darren said, you know judged from the other's reactions, you know, whether this is going to be for the group or for solo and, and it, it could have worked that way. I think, you know, the only, the only way you really can blame Yoko in this scenario where, you know, John wanted to go off with Yoko and do that stuff is like, you're blaming her for existing and meeting John. You know, because she was not pushing this idea of him leaving the Beatles. If if he left the Beatles because he wanted to be with Yoko and do stuff with Yoko of the style that Yoko was doing, that's on him. That's not on her. Right. So, OK. <laughs> Ken broke up the Beatles. <laughs> no, don't put that on me, <laughs> please. Ken broke up the Beatles because he wanted all those solo McCartney albums. Yes. <laughs> all right. And, and living out. in the material world. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we could keep coming up with these because there's a, there's a bunch of them here and uh, uh, of, of these misconceptions, but uh, the clock is a ticking on the wall. I don't actually have a clock on the wall, but in theater of the mind, uh, so it is uh, just about time for us to uh, throw it around the room. And uh, before, before I throw it to Ken for your uh, information, Ken, uh, while we were recording about a half an hour ago or so, and you mentioned this in the news about the Grammys, hmm. came the announcement of when the Grammys are now going to happen. Okay. So I figure that, you know, being that at the beginning of the show, we didn't know. Now we know April 3rd in Las Vegas. Okay. Were those those two little dings we heard? I heard those things too. No, that's not what they were. Hmm. Um, uh, those uh, dings, I don't know what those dings were, but uh, maybe the dings in my head. Speaking of dings in the head, let's go over to Ken and uh, get your information, Ken. Give me that ding. Dad. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, it's been pretty busy lately. I just did an interview with Al Sussman, Tom Franchone, with Bruce Spizer. And uh, since I can't get enough of talking about Get Back, 
I'm sure I'll be doing more shows on Get Back, and we could always do more here if you guys want. Um, it's mainly about Get Back, and we talk a bit about the passing of Ronnie Spector. That's on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. I also did an interview with a guy named Mike Miller, who is the lead singer and bass player for a Paul McCartney tribute band from New England called One Sweet Dream. And we do a number nine dream show on, on Paul. Uh, where I have three different categories on Paul, and he's got to name his top three in each category. Again, that's a Ken Michaels radio. Please subscribe to that. My other um, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles. But there's that thing again. There you go. Yeah, that, Talk no, More Talk. That's this. There's a thing in my head. Never mind. <laughs> Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Our next show will be next Monday, uh, which is January the 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern. It's a live broadcast and that it stays online uh we'll be talking about uh, our favorite solo beetle videos of the 70s specifically from that decade okay just go to our youtube channel for talk more talk a solo beetles video cast for that um my syndicated radio program every little thing which by the way come this march celebrates its 40th anniversary 40 years since i started doing Beatles radio programming. Um, my newest show will include a thematic set of charity recordings from the Beatles through the years, and also a set of Beatle and solo Beatle demos. And on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, you will find a page for that show, which lists all the radio stations that carry it when they broadcast it with links to their websites so you can stream them. Okay, this is not uh, a show that you can listen to on demand. You have to listen to live streams from the actual radio stations. But that's on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, where you'll also find Weekly Beatles trivia, and you can win one out of ten great prizes every single week uh, on the website. So if you can, please, uh, please visit the website as often as you can. That's it. All right, Alan. Okay, you can reach me at Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can reach all of us at uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. Um, send us an email if you have uh, uh, other Beatles misconceptions that you hear. There it is again, that you hear a lot and that bother you and um, you want us to tackle, we'd be happy to. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. We have uh, at, at Things We Said Fab. Um, and uh, we have two Facebook pages for the show. Uh, things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans and Things We Said Today. Um, the shows are posted all over the place um, on, on both of those Facebook pages, uh, on YouTube, where the video version of this lives. Uh, audio versions live on uh, Podbean and uh, Apple iTunes, various other places. And um, that basically is it. All right. Thank you. And as for me, uh, you want to send me an email directly just to me and we could talk about these two guys. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I also, a few, few folks will check in, uh, especially those that maybe also listen to FUV, WFUV. My email address is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, and as for me on the radio, I'm all, I can be heard Monday through Thursday night starting at 10 p.m. and Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4 on WFUV 90.7 FM, uh, and we're on HD. I don't know if anybody pays any attention to HD radio anymore, um, but um, there are instances where, for example, WFUV, like this past Saturday, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, we air Fordham University College, Bat men's college basketball, and there was a game Saturday afternoon, uh, which was on 90.7 FM, but if you were in the car, you could flip to HD2, and, and, uh, and there I was, spinning tunes or listening on our website. Anytime you can listen anywhere you are at WFUV.org on our app, uh, and check us out there. And on Facebook, I'm on Facebook. I have two pages, uh, Darren DeVivo. The other page is Darren DeVivo, um, WFUV DJ and Beatles podcaster. 
uh, and uh, join both of them covers all bases and uh, we'll be connected. Uh, and this turned out to be a fantastic topic. I will admit before we started, I was uncertain, uh, but it was great. And we could do a part two and actually maybe we should at some point do a part two with some more things, uh, maybe that dig a little deeper than did Yoko break up the Beatles. Mm -hmm. But I thought that that one is kind of like the one that everyone brings up. So we should at least acknowledge it. But uh, again, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, so for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, we will be back in a couple of weeks. We will see you then. Peace and love. Thanks for watching and listening.